All right, so today we are actually doing our last Old Testament covenant, an Old Testament figure. So we're going to be studying about God's covenant to King David. Uh, again, really important. So David lived about a thousand years before Jesus, um, which is itself kind of interesting, right? That that's how God lined it up. One thousand years before Christ was David, and really David is the last of the major figures that God makes a covenant with. There's other people who come after David, but the kind of table is set for the messianic expectations after David. So we're going to study that today. Uh, particularly, we are going to, we're, we're really just going to, like we've been doing, we're just going to cover the section where God makes these promises to David. Okay? Um, and also, and I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but Yes, David is one figure, and Noah, and they're, they're, but they represent the people, right? They're, uh, figure, they're the leader of the people, and they represent the people. So it's God making a covenant with his people through uh, the leader, okay? So we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 7 today. So if you want to turn there. Second Samuel is pretty much all dedicated to uh, David. It kind of shows the, the rise, the triumph, and then the fall of David. It's a yeah, really fascinating book of the Bible. But we're going to uh, go to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, just to give some, some background, well, well, I guess I'll read it, and then I'll, and then I'll kind of, I'll read it, and then we'll, we'll talk about the kind of background of what God is talking about or what David's talking about. So starting with verse 1. Now when the king dwelt in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies round about, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Okay, so just in those three verses, kind of what's going on there. Well, David, uh, he chose Jerusalem to be his capital. There's a few reasons for that. Jerusalem is a stronghold. It is literally built on a mountain, okay? And when you're there, I mean, it's, it's, you see how much of a high point is compared to all the places around it. It's really hard to capture. Well, he captures it, establishes his capital there for practical reasons, partly, but also religious reasons, because Jerusalem is the site where uh, Abraham sacrificed Isaac. And also, there's a few other uh, important things about that particular site. And so David sets up his capital in Jerusalem, and he conquers all of his enemies. So he's at a point in his life where he's the king, and he kind of doesn't have any threats from within or from without. And the first thing that he thinks, which shows how much of a man he was after God's own heart, is he thinks, well, I've built my palace. He did build a palace in Jerusalem. And he thought, but God, this whole time, has been dwelling in a tent. And this goes back to Exodus. God wanted to dwell among his people Israel. So he told them how to construct a tent. And that was the tent of meeting where God's presence dwelt among the people of Israel. And he traveled with them all through the wilderness and all through the promised land. And he's still been dwelling in a tent, in the, in the Ark of the Covenant, which is in a tent. And so David thinks, well, this is not right if... For me to live in a palace, but God lives in a tent still, I'm going to build a house for God or a temple. This was kind of David's, now that we're in peacetime, I'm going to build a temple, right? So that's David's plan. He talks to Nathan, the prophet, who was the prophet at the time, to kind of say, hey, do you think this is a good idea? And Nathan is like, yeah, it's a great idea. We need to give God a dwelling place fit for him now that we're in this peacetime, okay? So moving on with the text at verse 4. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel? whom I com commanded my shepherd, my, to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? 
So Nathan goes to bed that night after telling David, yeah, hey, that's a great idea. Go for it. God comes to Nathan in a dream and says, whoa, wait a minute. Like, I didn't ask you to build me a, a temple. Like, you know, I, not that God's offended, but it's like, you know, I didn't ask, I didn't ask for that. Like, you know, I, I've been dwelling with you all this time and I'm fine. You know, like, I'll let you know when I want to, you to build a temple for me. And actually, and we'll see what, what happens, but God doesn't want David to build the temple. He wants Solomon to build the temple. Part of the reason God gives for that is that David had a lot of blood on his hands. Not that, you know, because he, he had to defeat all of Israel's enemies. And God wanted somebody to build his temple who hadn't kind of shed all that blood, even if it was part of war and justified. That's part of the reason. But God also has his reasons, and it's wrapped up in this prophecy that we're going to hear. But basically what God's saying is he's reminding part of, um, he, he's saying basically, I didn't, I didn't ask for a house. You know, like, that's great that you want to give me a temple, a house, but just remember, I didn't ask for that. And then he goes on to tell Nathan in verse 8. He starts, to, he, he really, what he's going to go into here, God, is going to remind David through Nathan, like, remember that I'm the one doing all this stuff for you, okay? Like, don't get it in your heads that you're the ones glorifying me. I'm the one who's actually been doing this for you all along. So he says, verse 8, Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place, and be, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. So God here is reminding David, like, remember, you know, I'm the one who's done all this for you. You know, it's great that you want to do something for me, but it's not like your success has come from me, not vice versa, right? And also, too, David's story is a reflection of Israel's story. Like I said, and especially in ancient times, we don't think of it in the same way. Uh, but the leader was a reflection of the people, and the people were a reflection of the leader. We still kind of have remnants of that at times, but we tend to not identify ourselves with our leaders in the same way that ancient peoples would. You know, If the king is, is healthy and doing well, then the people are, doing, are healthy and well. If the king's not doing so well, we're not doing so well. Their identity, you can kind of see it a little bit in England. Like I, I lived in England for a summer, and they are very devoted to their queen, right? And like what she's up to and, and you know, her honor and stuff like that. It's not quite the same, but we're not really, especially in America, we don't really do that. But in this time, you know, David represents his people. Well, God's telling David, just like with Israel, you know, I'm the one who took you from what you were doing and brought you and made you a king, or in the case of Israel, brought you and made you my people. And, and he's just kind of reminding them that, you know, I'm with you, okay? The other thing, too, and you can see this, remember, um, God reminds David of the promises that he made to Abraham. So remember a couple weeks ago, we were talking about the promises that God told Abraham he's going to do. Well, in verse... Uh, Verse 10, God says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. I'm going to give them land again, right? Remember, the first promise was land and a nation because they are together, right? You need land to have a nation and vice versa. You can't just be a nation wandering around in the wilderness forever, right? You need to have land. So God reminds David of what he's promised and what he's been doing, that he's giving them a land, making them a nation. That's in verse 10. And in verse 9, he says, I'm going to make... I promise, and I will make your name great. I think, remember when I talked about how uh, great name means like a royal name, you know, famous royal name. You know, you'll be the, Abraham was told, you know, you'll be the father of kings and, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So God's just, all he's doing, right, so far, he's just reminding David of the promises that he's already made to Abraham and kind of doubling down on those. So there's that all, but all this is, all this is really still preface because now, now he's going to really double down and reemphasize and kind of take it even a step further. And notice that that's kind of the theme with God, right? I hope that's one of the things that kind of studying in this way that God is always faithful to his promises. And not only that, he doubles down on them constantly 
And then he even goes beyond what he's already promised, to promise even more, even when the Israel doesn't deserve it, right? So what he's going to do, so we'll keep reading, the second half of verse 11, he says, uh, God says, moreover, so again, moreover, like, you know, remember all that stuff I've done for you, and now I'm going to go beyond that. Moreover, the Lord, your God, uh, Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Make you a house. Well, so there's various meanings of the term house. Uh, it's kind of like a term. It's it, like, yes, it could be a literal building, okay? Because we're talking about, David is talking about building a house or a temple for the Lord. So it could mean a building or a house or a temple. But it also means family or dynasty. So, like, a equivalent of, like, kind of what it, what's included in this term is, like, the House of Windsor, which is the ho royal house of the, fam of the royal family in England, or the House of Habsburg, which was a really prominent royal house in uh, Central Europe for thousands of years, right? So, when God says, I'm going to build you a house, you know, he's saying, I am going to build for you a dynasty, a family name, a you know, the house of David, right? Um, so that, that's, it, it includes the, it can include building and temple, but it's going beyond that to be like a dynasty. Like we think of like a great house, a royal house, okay? So continuing uh, verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body and I will establish his kingdom. What is that an echo of? Offspring. Your offspring. Do you remember? Like the second week. Does that ring a bell? Remember? Well, yeah. So there's Abraham, right? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's another reference I was going to mention. Yeah. Abraham, it says that your offspring, right? There's a promise of offspring. But it even goes farther back than that. Remember Genesis 3.15? The offspring, the prophecy that's given to Adam and Eve is the offspring of the woman will defeat the servant, serpent, right? So again, you know, that, that's very much uh, echoed here. And then also with Abraham, you know, these promises are going to be fulfilled through your offspring. You know, literally, I mean, it says, like, literally, we'll, uh, we'll shall come forth from your body, right? And I will establish a kingdom. Uh, so... David's offspring is going to have a kingdom. Now, as we've been doing, of course, how does... Well, one thing that we're going to see, this is fulfilled. A lot of these promises to David are fulfilled on two different levels, right? There's Solomon, okay, David's son, who does have a kingdom, the offspring of David who becomes the king. Because remember, too, that uh, who was the king before, before David? I almost gave it away. Saul, right? And how long did Saul's dynasty, how long did Saul's house last? How many kings were in Saul's line? Just one, right? It's not a trick question. Right? There's just one, right? Because remember, the whole, what's, what's leading up to this is the whole story of how David becomes king, but he goes about it in the right way. He doesn't do it by murdering or assassinating Saul. He has a chance to multiple times, but he says, I will not kill the Lord's, I will not kill the Lord's anointed. So part of the background to this is, you know, Israel's had two kings and two different houses already, right? The house of Saul and the house of, and Saul's house only lasted one king because he was wicked, right? Among other things. So God is making these promises that your house, you know, your son, your house will have a kingdom, right? They'll last for, well, you know, even one more king is an 100% increase from what we've had so far, you know? So, so God is promising it in light of there's been two kings and two houses, but God's saying with your house, the house of David, you will have an everlasting kingdom. Well, so yes, on one level, Solomon and the sons of David, the kings of Judah, fulfill that. They are a house that lasts much longer than Saul's, house does right but who ultimately fulfills the eternal kingdom who becomes the king who is of the house of david jesus, jesus right yeah 
that's part of the reason why, if, we, if you read the Gospels, especially, especially the Gospel of Matthew, the fact that Jesus is of the house of David is super important. Extremely important because of this promise right here. Okay? Because the Messiah is going to come from the house of David. That's what eventually this is interpreted as. That, that in order for the Messiah to be a true king, he needs to be a son of this house, the house of David. Not the house of Saul or whatever, you know. Okay? So let's keep going. God's going to keep... God's going to elaborate on what this means. Verse 13. He, the offspring, shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. So just with, just with those two verses, right? Okay, again, this is going to be fulfilled on a two, at least two different levels. Solomon is going to build a house for God. Solomon is the one who builds the temple, not David. That was God's choice that Solomon's going to build the temple. Um, also, of course, and then, so that's the one level. And of course, Jesus. Jesus builds the new temple, the temple of his body, right? Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up again. And St. John puts in there, just in case we missed it, he was talking about the temple of his own body, right? The new temple is the body of Christ, which that term is very rich. You can think of that on a few different levels, right? Where is the temple? Well, what's the body of Christ? Well, the Eucharist is the body of Christ. The church is also called the body of Christ. We are each members of the body of Christ. So on all those levels, there's the temple. Like, where do we worship? We don't go to one single spot. We don't go to Jerusalem. We don't even go to Rome, right? We don't need to. We can, and it's great to go there, but... <laughs> For different reasons. But we don't go there to worship. The Jews only worshiped at the temple in Jerusalem. Now the new temple is wherever Christ's body is. And he even says, like, where two or three are gathered, I am there among them. So even something like this, which is not a formal, like we're not worship, it's not a formal, it's not a liturgy. But where the body of Christ is, there is Christ. That's the new temple, right? So Jesus builds, uh, builds the, the ultimate house of dwelling for God. Because Jesus, again, what is a temple? It's the dwelling place of God on earth. Well, what greater temple can there be than a man walking around who is fully God and fully man? He is the dwelling place of God on earth. And then that's sacramentally passed into the Eucharist and into us, his followers. Okay? So the temple, this theme of temple is very rich throughout the Bible and it's very important, right? About what God's trying to do. So, so, so both Jesus and Solomon build a temple. Also, uh, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Jesus is the king of kings. His kingdom will never end. And his kingdom is not of this earth, but his kingdom uh, is in heaven. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't have implications for this earth. But we pray in the Our Father, we pray, what? Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. All the other kingdoms of the world, including David's earthly kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, kingdom of judah uh passes away eventually so jesus comes to establish david the house of david not on earth but the kingdom of heaven remember remember how pilate says you know are you a king and jesus says you know you say i'm a king he says but my kingdom is sent basically my kingdom is not of this world right and that's good news right because this world is passing away if jesus came to establish a kingdom here even as great as it would be it passed away but instead, he establishes the heavenly kingdom that will never pass away. And that kingdom is meant to invade this earth. But that's why we pray on earth as it is in heaven. Because the kingdom is in heaven. Right? Okay? So that's how Jesus ultimately fulfills this promise. And then the next verse, uh, I will, verse 14. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Now, again, you know, God has a special... We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on Solomon, but... God has a special relationship with Solomon, right? He, he, uh, he promised, he asked Solomon, you know, what, what gift would you have of me? And Solomon asked for wisdom, and God's very pleased with that. Right? He, Solomon is like a son to God, right? And the kings of Judah as well, even when they're not, uh, not so good. But, of course, ultimately, what is this pointing to, you know? The father is talking about his eternal son. The father and the son who exist from all eternity. And that Jesus identifies himself 
as the son of God and that God is his father, right? Now, again, this goes way beyond like what, what David could have imagined at the time. But is it, it's no true of, you know, who is it more true of that for Jesus to be, God to be his father and he to be the son? There's, you know, that's what it all points to. Okay? Okay, so we'll keep going with uh, verse 13. When he commits iniquity, the son, when he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But I will not take my merciful love from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. So again, remember, right? Like, you know, Saul's dynasty didn't last very long. Saul turned away from God, and rightly so, God took him out of the throne, right? So David's probably wondering in the back of his mind, like, well, what if my son, my offspring, my sons, you know, my line, what if they're not faithful to you? What if they stray? And God is saying, you know, no, even, even if, you know, they stray, I will discipline them as sons, right? But I won't take my merciful love from them. I'm not going to start over with a new dynasty. Right? I will be faithful to your sons. I, I took Saul out, and rightly so, but I will not do so with your house and with your, with your dynasty. Uh, there's, there's kind of an echo here of uh, Hebrews 12, 7 through 11, where the author of Hebrews, probably Paul, but we don't know <laughs> for sure, uh, says that, you know, when you receive discipline from God, rejoice. Because a son or a child is disciplined by their parents, right? Because the parents love them. If you're not being disciplined by God, then that means he doesn't actually love you, right? Same with you and your, any of those of you who have children, right? If you don't discipline your kids, what they? they become spoiled, right? They become a menace to themselves and others. Well, if God doesn't discipline us like sons and daughters, that means he doesn't care. When we're straying, you know, so there, that, there's a, 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 it's Hebrews 12, 7 through 11 where, where that's talked about. So actually, so he says rejoice in the discipline because discipline is what, you know, it's a parent, a father who cares about us that actually gives us discipline. Well, that's definitely echoed here. And he does. He disciplined God, will discipline the kings of Judah when they start to stray from him. Uh, but also, how does this apply to Christ, though? I mean, Christ didn't commit iniquity, right? So, I mean, you could say, well, this doesn't apply to him because it's a, if they commit iniquity, if they stray to me. Well, Jesus didn't. But I would also point out that what does this passage remind you of in Jesus' life? I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the sons of men. What event? What? Yeah. Jesus is scourged, right? Not because he committed iniquity, not because he sinned, but because he took upon himself the sins of the world. He was scourged for our offenses and bruised for our sake. So, you know, this passage definitely points forward to like to G G it definitely applies to jesus in that way that while he didn't sin he took upon our sins as if they were his and he received scourging he literally was beaten with the rods of men and, and received stripes right from the, the scourgers the roman soldiers right so this is definitely pointing forward that you know even you know he and that's how much like he takes away so Right here, God is giving a prophecy or a preview of what even is going to happen to the king of kings. Not because of him, but because of us, right? Especially as we enter into, into uh, Holy Week soon, you know, just to think about that. How God is, God is making a prophecy here about what is going to happen to his son. Yeah. Um, okay. And then... Uh, Go to we're at verse 16 now, right? Uh, verse 16, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all these vi this vision, Nathan spoke to David. So again, uh, you know, this prophecy or, or this kingdom, this house of David, after Saul's house, which lasted for one king, is going to last forever, right? Pretty big promise, especially given the recent history of Israel and how their, their first king only lasted for one king. Uh, but also, so uh, 
part of what, and especially again as we enter into Holy Week in a couple weeks, um, think about how, so, so this is the kingdom of Judah is what it be, eventually becomes called. The kingdom, David's sons are the kings of Judah. And, as, you know, the, the messianic promises come to be associated with this, that the Messiah will be of the house of David, who will establish a kingdom that won't end, right? That's what God was promising here. So think about how Pilate kind of unwittingly puts what over Jesus's cross? What's the, what's the charge? With, over crosses, they would put, when they were crucifying criminals, they would put the charge so that everybody could see. Part of crucifixion was to humiliate the person who's being crucified and their family and everything, right? So they would put the charge of the person over top. Well, what does Pilate put is the thing that Jesus is crucified for? King, king He's king of the Jews, right? Now, the Pharisees are upset about this. They're very upset about this. Can you see why that would be? Because to call someone the king of the Jews, right, even if Pilate did so unwittingly, to call someone the king of the Jews is to say he is the king of David's line. He's the king of the house of David. He's the son of David, a.k.a. he's the eternal king, right? He's the Messiah. So what the Pharisees, they're really, really upset. And what they tell Pilate is, hey, we want you to put, he said he's the king of the Jews, right? But Pilate didn't put that. Pilate just put king of the Jews, right? Because what they knew, what the Jews knew, and the reason why they were so upset about this, is what that's implying is all of these promises, right? You know, now Pilate didn't necessarily know what he was doing, but it's kind of interesting. I mean, it's, a, it's not really a coincidence. It's God's providence that, like, the truth actually is put on the cross. Jesus is the king of the Jews. And not to, not because to, he's going to fulfill, um, fulfill David's, these promises to David and how David's line is going to last forever. So that's why the, like I said, that's why the Pharisees were so upset about it because it was like, you know, kind of astounded. But Pilate said, what I've written, I've written, and he left it, you know. Again, I think in God's providence, right? <laughs> um, okay. So then the next verse, so that's God's promises. So we're going to read a couple verses of David's response. Okay, so God, God tells David, you know, so again, think about David. You know, he goes from like, yeah, like it's peacetime. I should build a temple for God. That's a great thing to do, right? And then God actually says, hey, I didn't ask for a temple. Actually, I'm going to build you a house, right? So God actually like takes David's good intention and like flips it around and says, I'm actually going to do this for you, right? Well, this is David's response. So starting with uh, verse 18, we're not going to read the whole response, but just the first part of it. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have spoken also of your, ser excuse me, of your servant's house for a great while to come and have shown me future generations. Okay, so the first part of that verse, David is saying like, yeah, you have brought me this far already. And that was, but that was a small thing for you. You've even promised even more than I could have, than I already have than what you've already given me and what I could have ever imagined. But there's an interesting phrase, and I don't know, I know it's in this Bible. Um, I think it's in the NAV as well. That term at the end that is translated here as a, uh, future generations david says um you've spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come meaning you've promised an everlasting kingdom and have shown me future generations it's, it's not a wrong translation but the, the hebrew is actually literally uh that instead of future generations you've shown me that this is the law for man in other words there's some and i don't know if that's reflected in other, it's a hard phrase to translate from the hebrew so future generations isn't wrong, but what David is, what David saw, or what what was revealed to him that he is definitely understanding this to be is that this law, this God's law, God's wisdom, is going to be for all men for future generations. That this that's what the this is the law for man. That that law, that wisdom of God, is going to come through David's house. Which again also echoes back to one of the promises to Abraham, 
right? That third promise, that Abraham's family will be a blessing to the entire nations. So David very much understands this in the context of that, that through my house and through this everlasting dynasty, God is going to reveal himself to all the nations, his wisdom, his law, his goodness, right? That we're not just, the Jews were never meant to just be a closed circuit, right? They were meant to be the place of worship and right and holiness for the true God so that they could then bless the nations. Well, God is saying to David, I'm going to do that through your house. And so David's like, you know, I thought, again, it was great enough what you've done for me, but you're even going beyond that so that through this house, it will be a blessing to all the nations, to the Gentiles, okay? And again, that's echoing um, what was already promised to Abraham, but God's kind of being more specific about how he's going to do that through David's house. Well, so actually this is fulfilled in Solomon's life. Um, if, uh, if you remember uh, Solomon, so he builds, this, he builds a temple, he builds this great kingdom, and the kings and queens of the world come to see the wonders of his kingdom. Most of, importantly of all is uh, the queen of Sheba, who is a queen from a far off land. And she's like, I've heard about how great you are, Solomon, but I had to come see for myself, you know. And it's even better than what I was told, right? And she's just amazed, right? Uh, so again, the nations are coming to see the wonders that God has done for Israel, right? Uh, and Jesus actually specifically mentions the queen of Sheba's visit to King Solomon. Again, the queen of Sheba is a Gentile, she's not a Jew. But Jesus says in, uh, in Matthew 12, 42, he says uh, that, you know, uh, well, here, I'll just go there. I'll read it. <laughs> Matthew 12, 42, Jesus says, so he's, he's uh, rebuking the Pharisees in the context of this. <laughs> he says, the queen of the south, Sheba's south of Israel. So the queen of Sheba will arise at the judgment from this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Right? So, of course, you know how Solomon, yes, in a, certain, in a very real sense, Solomon fulfilled that promise that the Gentiles would come and marvel at Israel and what God has done for them. Well, Jesus actually references that high point in their history when the Queen of Sheba came. He references and says, yeah, that was great, but something greater than Solomon is here, namely me, right? <laughs> like, that's what he's telling them, okay? Mm -hmm. But the Pharisees don't get it, right? They're blind, but that's, but that, again, Jesus, while Solomon fulfills this promise of David's kingdom blessing future generations, blessing the Gentiles, Jesus does that infinitely more, right? All of us, I would guess, most of us are Gentile of origin, probably not Jew. Maybe we have some Jewish blood, a few of us, but, um, you know, we are blessed through a son of David, through the king of David, who has given us access, worship, you know, holiness from the God of Israel, right? So, okay, so that's, that's kind of the passage there. Another, um, it's related to this is, um, so as you all know, or hopefully know, uh, David wrote the Psalms, or most of them are attributed to David. Uh, David was not just a king and a warrior, he was also a poet and a songwriter. Well, there's a few psalms, and we're not going to read all of them, but a few psalms that are called the royal psalms. And these psalms specifically kind of harken back to that promise we just, just read and kind of draw out, David's drawing out the implications of, like, what does this all mean? Like, how wonderful this king is going to be, right? And what based on what God has promised me. So these psalms, we're not going to read them all, but... The royal psalms, um, among others, but the principal ones are Psalm 2, Psalm 72, Psalm 89, and then Psalm 110. We will look a little bit at Psalm 110. It's a very, uh, it's one of the most referenced psalms in the New Testament. As far as, under, in, as the first followers of Jesus, we're trying to unpack who Jesus is and what, is, what does he mean. So Psalm 110 we want to turn there. So the first verse is, uh, it's a Psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand 
till I make your enemies your footstool. So Lord, the first Lord, is just a substitute for God's name. Israel would never write or utter God's name, Yahweh, right, because it was too sacred. The reason why we do, as Christians, we're not, is because we've been given the name of God in Jesus, right? Um, but God's name is holy. And so the first Lord is, it's Yahweh says to my Lord, meaning God says to the king, right? Um, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies. So God is promising to the king that I will put, you know, I will, all your enemies will, won't have to worry about them. Well, if we flip forward again back to Matthew, and again, Matthew is very big on Jesus is the new David, okay? Matthew's audience was primarily Jews, and so he is really emphasizes throughout his gospel better than the others. Um, it's there in the others, but it's very hit hard in Matthew that Jesus is the son of David, right? Because for a Jew, that automatically triggers all those things we were talking about earlier with these promises. Well, Jesus references this psalm. Uh, if we go to Matthew 22, verse 41. Again, in an encounter with the Pharisees. So a lot of times we think of the Pharisees as trapping Jesus, but we forget there's actually a couple times, where, there's a few times where he stumps them, and this is one of them. So if we go to Matthew 22, now while the Pharisees, verse 41, now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, what do you think of the Christ? Whose son is he? So he's, you know, yeah, where is the Messiah going to come from? They said to him, the son of David. Like, duh, right? Like, that's the Messiah is going to come from the line of David. He's the son of David, okay? So Jesus said to them, How is it then that David, inspired by the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I put enemies, your enemies under your feet. Again, just quoting that verse from the psalm, right? If David thus calls him Lord, how is he how is he his son and if no one was able, and no one was able to answer him a word nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions so what jesus is saying to the pharisees is if david's writing this psalm and he says the lord god says to my lord david's lord says how is it possible then how can david call his son his lord right because especially remember in jewish culture a father is greater has greater dignity than a son right you gave a certain respect and dignity to a father right before his son but david but jesus is pointing out to the pharisees he's saying he's, he's stumping them right he's saying david is reverencing calling his the second lord there calling his son his lord because this this psalm was came to be seen as a promise of the messianic king right so jesus is pointing out to the pharisees like you know, David is showing deference and reverence to his own son, which seems kind of backwards. Well, how, why would David do that? Because he foresaw that his, in some way, that his son, the Christ, would be greater than him, right? That David's son, Jesus, David, I mean, David, could David have known that, that it was, oh, he's going to be Jesus of Nazareth, you know? <laughs> no, not necessarily, but David knew that my son will be greater than, than me. So he refers to him as the Lord. God says to my Lord, my son, right? And D Jesus kind of stumps them because they just can't even wrap their minds around it, right? They're like, they don't even dare to ask him any more questions, right? So Jesus, again, Jesus is referring, you know, he's trying to get the Pharisees and the people to say like, you know, I'm greater than David, right? <laughs> you know, like, yes, I'm his son, but I'm greater than him. And David even implies that. Right. The other thing to point out about, so in the rest of this psalm is basically about how the king, the, the messianic king, David's son, is going to conquer all the enemies and the Lord will be with him. Right. And then uh, in verse four, in, uh, back to Psalm 110, it says, the Lord has sworn, God has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. If you want to read about Jesus' priesthood and how he is the priest, that's like the whole theme of the book of Hebrews. Really wonderful book to read uh, right around Holy Week because it talks about how Jesus is our priest who gives us the eternal sacrifice. Jesus, what, what this is saying is that the king is also a priest. The Messiah is a priest king. 
and he supersedes the Levitical priesthood. Because Melchizedek is a figure from Genesis. I don't, do we talk about Melchizedek with Abraham? Not really. Okay, well, anyway. Melchizedek was a figure who was a priest king who offered to Abraham an offer that, you know, an offering of bread and wine. It's kind of interesting, right? You know, and, and Melchizedek was a priest king of the Most High God, right? And he's a foreshadowing of Christ, right? And it precedes the Levitical priesthood, the priesthood that Moses established, right? And so right here, David is, saying, is, is in his writing the psalm is saying, the Messiah is going to be a king, but he's also going to be a priest. He's going to be a priest king, like Melchizedek. So like I said, if you want to, like, to unpack that, the book of Hebrews is, is that's what, that's the whole argument of Hebrews is Jesus is the priest king and his priesthood supersedes that of the Levites. That was good for the time, but it couldn't get the job done, right? Jesus is the priest king who gives us the eternal sacrifice, okay? Um, so anyway, this Psalm 110, really important. And Jesus even uses it to try to get past the hard hearts of the Pharisees so they, they can see that I'm, I'm greater than David, is basically what he's trying to say, trying to get them to see, right? Okay. Um, did, did everybody, did you guys bring, uh, bring this PowerPoint? Okay. So we'll, we'll go through, like we did last week, we'll just go through these. Uh, some of them we already went through, but there's a few things in here that are um, kind of add to it a little bit about... Again, uh, going along with the theme, right? How is Jesus, how is Jesus the new David? Well, uh, Jesus is the son of David. Uh, so, opening of Matthew's gospel, again, you'll hear, uh, if you read the first chapters of Matthew, lots of references to David, David, David. The genealogy, right? David is a huge point in the genealogy, in Matthew's genealogy. Uh, Joseph, it's emphasized that Joseph is the son of David. And that, you know, the Messiah is the son of David, right? That's big in Matthew's gospel. Again, because Matthew's audience was primarily Jews at first. So he's trying to signal to them, like, this is the king that we were promised, that David was promised. We were promised through David. Maybe it's a better way to put it. Okay? Jesus is born in the city of David, which is Bethlehem. That's where David was born, right? So there you go. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it was a... You know, divine coincidence, really providence, that Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem, to the city of David, for the Messiah to be born, right? The new king. Another thing, and, and this is an image that we uh, sometimes lose in the gospel accounts, but part of the picture of Jesus in the gospels is that he's a warrior king, like David. David was a warrior king. He was the best warrior in Israel's history. I mean, he defeated Goliath, but then he went on to... Be, in fact, that was what made Saul jealous of him. <laughs> so one of the things is uh, the, the women of Israel, meaning the ladies, <laughs> were, were singing a song where they said, David has, uh, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. Well, Saul, is, Saul hears the ladies, the young women, singing these songs, and he gets jealous, right? So some things never change, right? You know? <laughs> but, but it's just kind of funny, you know? But it's like, well, it totally fits with, like, human nature, right? You know? So Saul's like, why do they, you know, why do they, why do they say Saul only has slays thousands while David slays his tenth? And he gets jealous of David because David was popular with the ladies, all right? Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so David was a great warrior king, right? Well, Jesus is also, in the Gospels, he is a warrior king, right? Now, not against the Philistines, but think about all of the, you know, think about how Jesus deals with demons, right? Like, he's, there's all this action, right, where Jesus is like, get out of him, go over that, you know. Jesus is, is healing people, casting out demons, right? He's Yahweh in the flesh coming to save his people, right? To fight against the powers of darkness and the evil spirits that are holding his people captive, right? Sometimes, like, there's nothing necessarily wrong with Jesus as the meek and gentle, you know, with the lamb on his shoulders, right? That, that's good, and there is that part of him. But also, like, he was, a, he was a controversial figure in his time, right? And he was also a man of action who was, you know, when, it, when a demon came by, right, he's God. So he's not just like, oh, demon, you know. No, he's like, get out of him, and it happens. Nobody quit, you know, he's a warrior, right? 
And his ultimate warrior act is on the cross, you know. Not because he's cutting others down, but because he lets himself be cut down, right? You know? So that's, another, that's an image that is very present in the Gospels and would have been picked up at the time. The warrior king come to save his people. But we kind of miss that because I think we probably tend a little too far the other way where he's just nice Jesus. You know? like, like, yeah, okay, there is that part. He is very kind to people when he needs to. But when, when you know, watch some of his interactions with the Pharisees or with demons, you know, he doesn't mess around. He's a warrior king come to save his people, right? Uh, just like David. David was a warrior king. Uh, Jesus crushes the head of his greatest enemy, Satan. Just like how, uh, you know, a lot of people think, so David fought Goliath. A lot of, sometimes people think he killed him with a sling, but he actually didn't. <laughs> Do you know how David killed Goliath? He cut his head off. He cut his head off. David used a sling to knock him out, right? He, he used a sling and hit him between that, and it knocked Goliath out, and Goliath fell over. But then uh, David took Goliath's own sword and cut his head off. What is that evocative of, again? That first promise, the Proto-Evangelium, Genesis 3.15. You see why this is really, that's a really important verse? That the, the offspring of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, Right? Jesus crushes the head of Satan, just like how David cut off Goliath's head, right? And actually, what is the weapon that Jesus uses to cut off the head of the serpent? Death. Jesus uses Satan's own weapon against him. Death was what allowed Satan to have dominion over all of us, right? That ultimately we all die and we go to the realm of Satan. But Jesus takes Satan's own weapon, death, and that's the punishment, right? When they eat the apple, you will die, right? Jesus takes Satan's own weapon, death, and turns it on its head so that death becomes the pathway to eternal life. That if we die with Christ, we will receive eternal life. So death is nothing to fear for a Christian, right? Before then, it was. But Jesus takes death itself and makes it the path to eternal life. That's part of what's symbolized in baptism, especially a full immersion baptism. You're immersed in the waters because you die with Christ, and then you rise to him. There's a beautiful reflection by one of the first church fathers where he imagines Jesus as like bait for death, death as this monster fish or something. And Jesus uses his humanity as bait for death, and death like swallows him up. But it's like, well, guess what? He's actually God, so he's alive. So he can't die, right? And death, like, and he explodes death from, like, the inside, right? It's kind of an interesting, beautiful image of, like, how Jesus actually turned death on its head so that death, Satan's weapon, death, becomes the path to eternal life for us. Um, Jesus rides, well, Palm Sunday's coming up. Jesus rides into Jerusalem with great fanfare on Palm Sunday. David also did the same thing. David brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem and danced before the Ark of the Lord, right? He made, one of, he made his wife upset about that, and then she never had children. That was her punishment, <laughs> um, is what the Bible says. But anyway, because uh, uh, he, was, he was rejoicing before the Lord as he came into Jerusalem, right? Jesus rides triumphantly as a king on a donkey into Jerusalem. Already talked about this one. Jesus is the king of the Jews. David is the king of the Jews, and his sons are kings of the Jews. Okay, this one, this is a little bit, I find this one really fascinating. This is great. Um, Jesus has a queen mother. So in the Davidic kingdom, do you know who the most important woman was in the Davidic kingdom? In the kingdom of the Jews, for David and his sons, who was the most important woman? Yeah, it was, well, yeah, it's on there. Right? <laughs> it was not the wife of the king, right? Because the kings in this time had multiple wives. That's just how they did it. That's another discussion, right? But they had multiple wives. But the king only had one mother, right? And she actually had a royal office. In Hebrew, it's uh, called Gabira, Gabira, which means great lady or queen mother. Because, again, you know, the king has lots of different wives, right, and lots of different children. But he only has one mom, okay? And so, and this, so this was actually not, so she was actually, the mother was actually the queen. She was the most important woman in the kingdom of Judah, 
Um, it was a royal title, Gariba, in Hebrew, and it was an office bestowed upon the mothers of the kings of, of uh, Judah. Uh, so scholars believe that queen mothers of the ruling house of David were crowned, occupied a throne next to their sons, and that both state and religious functions required their presence and attention. And there's evidence from other kingdoms in this time period that the queen mother was the most highly placed person in the kingdom next to the king himself. Uh, it's also significant that every mother of a Davidic king is listed in sacred scripture, right? Um, also, it's interesting to know that this term is Gariba is also used in Genesis as a title for Sarah. She is the first queen mother. Okay? Um, and then, and then that probably a few things that the queen mother would do, and there's a few passages in scripture where she does this. Um, the way that Solomon became king was David's on his deathbed, and Bathsheba, who is Solomon's mother, she comes to David and intercedes for Solomon and says, hey, David, husband, who you're about to die, remember that you promised to have my son be king. And David's like, oh yeah, I did. And then that's how Solomon becomes king, right? She intercedes for her son, right? Also, uh, there's a verse, 1 Kings 2.19. This is a little bit later, once Solomon's king. So Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him about Adonijah, who was a, someone who had asked, he, he didn't go direct, Adonijah, I don't know if that's how you say that, but he didn't go directly to King Solomon. He actually went to Bathsheba to ask a favor of the king. And then Bathsheba brought it before King Solomon. This is the verse talking about that. Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him about Adonijah. The king got up to meet her. Now again, like he got the king, Solomon, he got up, stood up when his mother came in the room, right? The king doesn't do that for anybody else, right, as a sign of respect. He then sat down on his throne, and a seat was brought for the king's mother, and she sat down on his right. So again, this special position of uh, Gariba was actually an established position in the Davidic kingdom. Well, part of what God is doing, right, is teaching us about this kingdom, right? Well, in Jesus' kingdom, who is the queen mother? Who's the most important woman in the kingdom? It's Mary, right? It's interesting, right? You know, that God, got, I mean, what I would say, God has been preparing, he's preparing his people so that in the new kingdom, in the new covenant, the most important woman is Jesus' mother. And she's, she's not the king, but she does have a special access to the king. People intercede through Mary to get to the king, right? She says, do whatever he tells you, right? In John's gospel, she's an intercessor, right? So anyway, that's, that's all foreshadowed in David's kingdom. This was, a, this was an office and a position. And when the king was deposed, eventually with the Babylonian exile, the queen mother also had to be deposed, right? That she was, she was with her, she was the queen with her son. It was an official. Son. So anyway, yeah, a lot of foreshadowing. Another, another thing, Jesus has a prime minister. So if we go quickly to uh, Isaiah 22. So this is uh, under the, you know, Isaiah 22, this is under the reign of Hezekiah. This is many generations after David. He's a son of David, a Davidic king. Hezekiah, by the way, is one of the good kings. Well, Hezekiah had a bad steward named Shebna. And God was not happy with Shebna. Uh, Shebna was uh, Hezekiah's right-hand man, the prime minister. And God's not happy. So God says to Shebna in verse 20, chapter 22, verse 20, in that day, I, God, will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. He, so basically what's happening is God is saying, Shebna, you're out. Elikiah, you're in as prime minister. I'm not happy with you, Shebna. Uh, I will clothe him, Eliakim, with your robe, Shebna's robe, and I will bind your belt on him and will commit your authority to his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. Yeah, and this is to the prime minister. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him like a peg in a sure place. And he shall become a throne of honor to his father's house. What does that sound like? What does that remind you of? Is that anything? 
Peter. How about Matthew 16, right? Where Jesus says to Peter, I give you the kingdom, keys of the kingdom of heaven. Again, what's the kingdom? It's a Davidic <laughs> kingdom. It's a kingdom of the Jews. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. It's the kingdom of heaven, right? Well, earlier on in the kingdom is the prime minister who's not the king, but he's the king's right-hand man. He's got the keys of the kingdom. And God is saying that part of, as part of his job, he has the king, the keys, and what he shuts will shut, and what he opens will stay open, right? So David, the kingdom of David, the uh, Jewish kingdom, had a prime minister who had the authority of the keys of the kingdom. He's not the king, but he has the keys, right? Well, in the new kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, Peter is given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the new Jewish kingdom, right? And what he binds will be bound, and what he looses will be loosed, right? So again, this is all for, the way that Jesus sets up his kingdom is very much in the line of David, and in, with all this history behind it of God foreshadowing how he's going to set it up. And how just how the, the prime minister is fastened like a peg in a square pay, play, a, a peg in a sure place. Well, how do you know if you're Catholic or not, right? It's am I in union with a bishop who's in union with the Pope, right? That like the Pope, part of his job, the office of the papacy, is meant to be a sure place on this earth so that you know if you're in union with the Church of Christ, right? That's part of, not the only job, that's part of the Pope's job, the office of the Pope, you know? If you, if you ever get, God forbid, to a point where you're not in union with the Pope, that's not a good sign. Right, you know. Okay, and then lastly, last thing, uh, and we already talked about this. Jesus' kingdom is everlasting, right? It will go on for eternity, and it's for all peoples. So Jesus fulfills all these promises and more that are made to